In July 1911, a 4,500-acre sheep ranch that had been owned by former dentist David Burbank years before was incorporated into a city that would bear his name. The city was located in the southeast corner of the San Fernando Valley, and, as the crow flies, it was just over 10 miles from downtown Los Angeles. Between 1911 and 1920, the city of only 500 swelled to nearly 10,000. Budding industries like entertainment and aviation soon put down roots and they eventually gave the new city much of its shape and character. In 1920, a group of husbands joined with their wives from the Burbank Women's Club to form a community choir named the Burbank Choral Club. It would be led for over 25 years by Charles Leroy Monroe. Over the next 90 years, the Burbank Choral Club and the Burbank Chorale, as it was renamed in 1985, would set a standard for longevity and musical excellence. It would sing at the Olympic Games and at two World's Fairs. It has had 12 conductors, and it has been broadcast on radio, television, and now on the Internet. Charles Leroy Monroe was born and raised in the Detroit, Michigan area. By the time he was 25, Monroe had gained success singing at the Detroit Opera House. He had never considered music his profession. Monroe only thought it a well-paying hobby. By 1920, he headed west to Los Angeles, where eventually the Burbank Women's Club offered the 33-year-old Monroe leadership of the newly formed Choral Club. One of the original 22 members of the Choral Club was a couple named Clyde and Mary Fainot. The Fainot's daughter, Joyce, literally grew up with the choir. Well, my parents were original members in 1920. When they started, I think there wasn't a whole lot else was available. But my mother was a pianist, and I just grew up hearing music. In 1923, the Burbank Choral Club greeted the arrival of a 30-something divorcee from Topeka, Kansas, who was as equally determined as she was talented. That year, along with two small children, she packed up for California in search of a new life. Her name was Myrtle Radcliffe Hart. When the respected musician took the job of accompanist for the choir, she never considered that she would eventually fall in love with Charles Monroe. In the mid-1930s, however, a 10-year-old, Joyce Faino, would be the flower girl at their wedding. Yes, it was in a house that is still exists over on Bethany Street. I preceded the bride down the stairs and uh, the men just had a simple wedding. The club was funded by the Burbank Parks and Recreation Department, and membership dues were $2 a year. Choir members would have to pay for their own music. The club practiced at various locations, but would play most concerts at John Muir School. Besides performing local shows, the Burbank Choral Club would take part in the Burbank Day Parade held every spring, and perform stage shows like Pirates of Penzance. In 1924, club member Cody Morgan, a tall, carrot-top Burbank High School graduate, composed a catchy foxtrot entitled in Burbank. Audiences fell in love with the tune, and Charles Monroe would perform it for decades as part of his musical repertoire. With the crash of 1929, propositions to ban funding for the arts were common. Despite the hardship, the city of Burbank in 1933 provided the club a desperately needed $30 check. Charles Monroe gratefully accepted it. Despite the grim times, the Coral Club's local reputation was rising. They regularly played at a Hollywood Bowl that still lacked its trademark shell and permanent seating. The Burbank Choral Club will give one of its excellent concerts tomorrow afternoon in the Gold Shell at Pasadena, a complete program. Saturday, November 3rd at 8 p.m. is the date for the next community sing under auspices of the Burbank Choral Club and High School. Direct your attention to the west end of the stadium. In 1932, the Choral Club, along with other groups, under the direction of U.S. Army Lieutenant Howard W. Roberts, sang the Star Spangled Banner at the opening ceremonies of the Los Angeles Olympic Games. Among those singing were Mary and Clyde Fainel. 
Clyde lived to see the Olympics return once again to Los Angeles in 1984. As the 1930s moved forward, the Coral Club enhanced its reputation further by playing at the World's Fairs in San Diego in 1935 and again in San Francisco in 1939. The club also found time to sing on local radio stations. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you this important bulletin. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. On December 7, 1941, all of that changed with the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. America was now involved with World War II, and the healthy young men of the Coral Club were going off to fight. Charles Monroe, like all Americans on the home front, made do for the duration by using the old and the militarily unfit to sing in the club. With gas rationing in effect, local concerts and performing for soldiers at the USO were the norm. Some joined the Coral Club to keep a sense of normalcy. Others sang to avoid thinking about the dreaded telegram from the War Department that could only bring bad news. As the war ended in fall of 1945, the Burbank Choral Club was indeed fortunate. None of the singers who left in 1941 were killed. In June of 1946, the Choral Club was beginning to change. Charles Monroe, the man largely responsible for guiding the Burbank Choral Club through years of prosperity, depression, and war, announced his retirement. Though 11 more followed him, Charles Leroy Monroe's accomplishments would be the benchmark by which succeeding conductors would be judged and the fruits of his labor would be heard through the voices of those who came after him. The following September, Victor Bogus, Burbank High School's choir director, took over. In the early 1950s, as a baby boom echoed throughout America, a tall redhead named Pat Gafford joined the group. We met at Burbank High in the band room, and dear Vic Bogus was the director, a very gentle, kind, uh, loving man that we enjoyed so much. By late 1957, Victor Bogus suddenly retired due to ill health. Dr. Lewis P. Nash, Director of Music Education for Burbank Unified School District, agreed to take over for two weeks. Nash's two-week job would last 13 years. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. In the spring of 1963, as America grappled with the question of racial equality, Lewis Nash asked acclaimed gospel singer Jester Hairston to lead the choral club in a concert for early summer. As the enthusiastic rehearsals continued, Hairston sensed, however, that the group's singing was stiff. Pat Gafford recalled Hairston joking, You sing like a bunch of Caucasians. Hairston then gently explained the deeper meaning of the spirituals. Joyce Neisel remembers, uh, for instance, oh, that was follow the drinking lord, and it meant to follow the, the giver. Yeah, a lot, he explained a lot. On an early June evening at a newly built Starlight Bowl, Jester Hairston held an audience of 5,000 under his spell, said the Burbank Review. Lewis Nash called the show a real service to the community. That night, a packed house, a black conductor, and an almost all-white choir experienced the joy of music sung by Negro slaves barely a hundred years before. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. Lewis Nash conducted the Burbank Choral Club during one of the most tumultuous decades in U.S. history. At the end of a very traumatic 1968, the Choral Club's Christmas concert featured Stravinsky's Symphony of Psalms. On that December 14th evening, the audience was comforted by the words, He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. Dr. Louis P. Nash could not have picked more appropriate and reassuring words for that year or for that decade. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. As difficult as the 1960s would be, Lewis Nash and the Burbank Choral Club celebrated its golden anniversary in 1970. Many of the original members from the 1920s, including Clyde Feyneau, 
sang with the group that night. As a special surprise, Jester Hairston returned and conducted several pieces. In the fall of 1970, Dr. Lewis P. Nash's 13-year temporary job as conductor ended. During the following 15 years, along with Watergate, disco, an Iranian hostage crisis, heavy metal bands, and Ronald Reagan, six more conductors would lead the choral club, including Jim Person, who provided stability to the group as a leader from 1977 to 1984. 1984 saw the coming of a local girl named Marguerite Flick, a retiree who joined the choral club under Jim Person. Flick grew up loving baseball, trumpet playing, and dancing. That year, while singing selections from Hello Dolly, and at just a few years past 39, I did some kicks and I did some twirls, had a big hat on with the boa, and uh, it went over great. In 1985, the Burbank Choral Club was rebranded as the Burbank Chorale and provided with a new logo. By 1989, a tall, jovial graduate from St. Olaf's University in Minnesota named Cliff Dunderland had taken up the baton. In the summer of 1992, Cliff Dunderland was shocked to learn that he had contracted the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. As the disease progressed, his accompanist, Frank Basile, assumed more of the duties as conductor from the piano bench. He was someone who was determined not to be sad for himself. He was determined to put the most positive possible face on everything. On the afternoon of February 7, 1993, a weakened Cliff Dunderland performed a Christmas concert deferred. While they watched Dunderland sit on a piano bench and conduct pieces from Bach and Handel, a growing sadness mixed with a profound compassion filled the hearts of Joyce Meisel and Marguerite Flick that afternoon. While sitting in a wheelchair in June of 1993, Cliff Dunderland watched his friend, Frank Basile, conduct music that Dunderland himself had selected months before. Uh, we did He Watching Over Israel, and then we did How Lovely Is Thy Dwelling Place uh, from the Brahms Requiem, and then we did the Cantique de Jean Racine by Faure. So that was sort of my little coded message to him in a following concert. Cliff Dunderland died later that summer. Like Louis Nash, Frank Bazile was now an accidental leader of a choir. And like Nash, Bazile was going to lead the Burbank Chorale and lead it in a new direction. The chorale began performing a mix of traditional pieces, but Bazile also expanded the repertoire to include Dixieland, Broadway show tunes, and in a salute to baby boomers, a show entitled Good Vibrations. In a concert on March 28, 1999, the chorale featured an interpretive piece about life after death by Rafe von Williams entitled, Toward the Unknown Region. Frank Bazile later thought, it felt like somehow during that piece of music we had come in contact with the infinite. We had had some sort of a group experience of infinity. It was almost as though we had all left our body, that we were no longer confined by ourselves or by this room we were in or even by the universe that we were in, that we had all somehow sort of just left that. In June 2000, the Burbank Chorale celebrated its 80th birthday. That year, Bazille would perform Franz Joseph Haydn's The Creation. The concert marked Basile's departure and heralded the emergence of a Russian emigre, a graduate from Moscow Music College and Conservatory, Misha Stangrud, as the chorale's next leader. Stangrud performed many classical numbers, but he also embraced the unorthodox. He featured works like Bohemian Rhapsody, The Beatles, and Karl Orff's Carmina Barana. He introduced Russian language pieces by Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky. Stangrud achieved critical acclaim by conducting Mozart's Requiem and John Rutter's Gloria. Under his leadership, a website was created where clips of previous concerts could be viewed. 
Every Christmas Eve since 2006, the Chorale has been invited to sing at Los Angeles County's Holiday Festival of Arts on live local television. It was at one of these concert broadcasts that many children in Los Angeles came to think that Santa Claus sang with the Burbank Chorale. It has been 90 years since 22 men and women met in the spring of 1920 to form a choral group. These singers and conductors, along with those that followed them, have left their mark as one of the oldest and most venerated choral groups in California. We look forward now to celebrating the Chorale's centennial. I hope that the members of the Burbank Chorale honor the legacy of the generations of men and women who committed to the Chorale and gave it all they had to keep it going all of these years. And I hope that with each beautiful piece of music that the Chorale does, they say thank you for being able to sing and being able to sing in a group. And I wish Burbank Chorale many more birthdays, and I hope it lasts forever. All right, anytime you're ready. And if you make a false start, we'll just keep going and start over. We live in Burbank, in dear old Burbank. This coral club is just a part of Burbank. Like sweet in Burbank, so bank of Burbank. An ideal city you will find is Burbank. If in its valleys or hills or moors, there's no other city you'd rather come home. You'll find fresh air there. The people care there in dear old Burbank town. Ooh, I love it! I love it! I love it! Thank you so much. History is preserved. <laughs>